We're going to direct our attention now to the proclamation of God's Word, and in particular, the passage found in the ancient book of Daniel and the fourth chapter. Let me just take a couple of moments while you're finding the place in your Bible, if you wish to follow it in your Bible, although I will recount the story for you as it's a long chapter. But let me just bring you up to date on the story of Daniel. The great king Nebuchadnezzar had overthrown Jerusalem. He had destroyed the temple and its worship and had carried off into his capital city of Babylon many of the leaders of the nation of Judah. Included in those leaders was a group of young men called Daniel and three of his friends. These three young men, or four, these four young men, were given a unique opportunity of having basically a full scholarship for three years in the University of Babylon in order that there they might study Babylonian literature with a view uh, to them being thoroughly enculturated in Babylon society uh, in order that they might take positions of leadership in the burgeoning uh, empire under Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the most powerful man in the world. The Babylonian Empire was the one superpower of the day. And so these four young men uh, were given a tremendous opportunity, but also presented with a great challenge, because uh, they did not buy into what Babylon stood for. In fact, b b basically, they took a position uh, that was, in many instances, diametrically opposed to what Babylon was about. And so they have this tremendous tension. How can they live as committed believers in Jehovah in a culture that is fundamentally alien? It is this tension, of course, that is tremendously helpful for us as we study it and make application in our day and age. The people of Babylon were much given to dreams. They had a pantheon of gods, and they believed that the gods communicated with them through dreams. And accordingly, they had some very, very significant people in the courts of Babylon whose specialty uh, was the interpretation of dreams. And a part of the training that Daniel and his friends were to have was in the Babylonian approach to dreams and the interpretation thereof. Nebuchadnezzar uh, would on occasion have dreams, and on one particular occasion, um, he called in his highly trained interpreters and told them that they must do two things. They must tell him what his dream was, and they must give the interpretation. And he then went on to say that if they failed to do either of these things, he would have them cut in little pieces and their houses destroyed uh, into rubble. Uh, they, of course, were incapable of doing this, and they remonstrated with him to no effect. But then Daniel was called on the scene, and Daniel, uh, as a result of prayer, uh, was, re was, uh, was helped by the Lord to understand the dream, and he made the interpretation. And accordingly, uh, Nebuchadnezzar became very favorably uh, inclined toward Daniel and his friends. But it was a very up-and-down experience uh, for Daniel and his friends, uh, because subsequently, Daniel, uh, excuse me, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, erected a massive statue, and he sent out word to all the peoples and all the nations of his empire uh, that everybody uh, must worship this statue. And if they didn't, yes, you've guessed it, they would be thrown into a fiery furnace, which he had specifically prepared uh, for people who did not do things his way. Uh, this, of course, presented another tremendous challenge and reminds us of the fact that Nebuchadnezzar was a peculiar mixture. He was, on the one hand, a somewhat enlightened ruler, but on the other hand, capable of incredible cruelty. He was, on the one side, uh, open uh, to a discovery of who Jehovah was and what Jehovah was all about, but at the same time, uh, he, he, he worshipped his own gods who were in diametric opposition to all that Jehovah stood for. In other words, to be in his court was to live in an extremely precarious situation. And that Daniel and his friends soon found out. Well, that brings us up to date. Now, in chapter 4, uh, something really quite remarkable is recorded for us. Nebuchadnezzar, who uh, was never 
particularly backward uh, at announcing what his wishes were in no uncertain terms and would send them out to all the nations and all the peoples and require the people to respond to what he was saying, uh, sent out a proclamation. But this proclamation must have caught everybody by surprise. For the proclamation starts out by saying, it is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs of wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. In other words, the most powerful man in the world, the ruler of the one remaining superpower, sends out a document which is his personal testimony of what has happened in his life between him and the Lord. Imagine what an impact that would have. He goes on uh, to explain uh, why he has come to this point of saying that the Lord kingdom is an eternal kingdom and his dominion endures from generation to generation. Now remember, he's the most powerful man in the world and remember, he runs the one remaining superpower but now he's talking about a most high God whose kingdom is eternal and whose dominion endures from generation to generation. In other words, the most powerful man in the world is saying, I have discovered something. I have discovered that God is God and I am not. I submit to you that that is the most important lesson that any person can ever learn. That God is God and I am not. And have Nebuchadnezzar testify to this and send the word out was remarkable. Well, I'm sure after people got over the shock of this announcement, they would want to say, well, what in the world happened to Nebuchadnezzar? And he goes on to explain in his statement precisely what happened. He said that he was at home in his palace, contented and prosperous, and he had yet another dream. And it was a very frightening dream, and he explains it. He said the dream was of a massive tree. The top of the tree touched the heavens and its branches extended over the whole world and its fruit and its leaves were delicious and the birds found rest in it. And he very quickly got the idea that this tree probably had something to do with him and his far-reaching empire. And while he was in his dream looking at this tree, a holy one, an angel, a watcher, we're not sure what the word means exactly, but it is talking about a heavenly being who is involved in the affairs of this world. That's something you either believe or you don't believe. But the scripture is unequivocal, that there are heavenly beings who are actively involved in the affairs of this world. And he said that this heavenly being then comes and makes an announcement about this tree and orders that the tree should be cut down and that its stump should be bound with iron. Uh, then the Holy One uh, de develops the announcement and stops talking about a tree and starts talking as if the tree cut down is a person and says, let him, not the tree, let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. This is the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has. He sees the great tree, the announcer says the tree is to be cut down, the stump is to be bound in iron, and this stump now becomes a person who will spend a, an undesignated period of time living in a total moral and emotional and spiritual breakdown in an attitude that is tantamount to the animal kingdom. But then he goes on to say this, that is the announcer, the decision is announced. And the purpose of this is to show that the Most High is sovereign over the kings of men and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of men. Well, this was this scary dream that Nebuchadnezzar has. He takes it very seriously and eventually Daniel is called in to give the interpretation. And Daniel is very reluctant to give the interpretation he says, in effect, your majesty, I wish that this dream referred not to you, but to your enemies. But I have to be honest with you, and I have to tell you what is going to happen. 
your kingdom is going to be taken away. You are going to go through an emotional, a physical, a spiritual collapse. You are going to learn the hard way, the most important lesson that a human being can ever learn, that God is God and you are not. And when you do learn that lesson, then you must renounce your sins by doing what is right and renounce your wickedness and begin to turn right around in the way that you function as a person and as the king in your kingdom. And if you do that, God will restore your prosperity. So this is the story that Nebuchadnezzar tells in the announcement that goes out right across his burgeoning empire and he concludes the announcement by saying, at the end of this time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards the heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever and ever. And then he added, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of heaven, because everything he does is right, and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. So what is the lesson for us in Daniel chapter 4? It is simply this, that everybody, however high or however lowly, somewhere along the line, needs to learn the biggest lesson a human being can ever learn. God is God, and you are not. I want you to notice that that probably is the most profound lesson you can learn. It's the most difficult lesson to learn and the most simple lesson imaginable to enunciate. <laughs> Actually, they're all monosyllables. God is God and you are not. Are there any words there that are too difficult for anybody among the children here to understand? What do you not understand about God? What about what about uh, you, you is there that you don't understand what is there about not that we don't understand nothing God is God and you are not now when we think in terms of this powerful message that Nebuchadnezzar is being taught we recognize that it relates first of all to him as being the most powerful man in the world it relates to him as overseeing the greatest uh, the, the, the greatest superpower in the world and what it is actually saying is this, that God is the most high one who is involved in the superpowers, the raising of them and the putting down of them. He is involved in the most powerful men and women in the world, the raising up of them and the putting down of them. And he is also involved in the affairs of the mighty and the lowly. In other words, God is God. And he needs to be acknowledged as such but the problem is this. All of us, by nature, want to be God of our own little kingdom. And therein lies the fundamental tension that men and women experience in their spiritual lives. It is possible for us, on the one hand, to say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, but I don't want him interfering with my life. I believe that Jesus is Lord, but I don't want to do what he says. I believe that one day I'm an answerable and accountable to God from whom I come, through whom I live, and to whom I'm accountable, but by the same token, I have not the slightest intention of living in loving, trusting obedience to him. And what we need to learn, of course, is that is the attitude is this. God is God, and I am God. When we think, however, of God in this way, we must be careful. Because it does not mean that God is so powerful that he just spends his time throwing his weight around. There are other powerful dimensions to his character that need to be brought into the picture. And there are three of them that we will notice from this particular passage of Scripture. They are as follows. Number one, the Most High is glorious. Number two, the Most High is gracious. Number three, the Most High is generous. He is certainly the Most High, but he is glorious, 
he is gracious, and he is generous. Now, obviously, there's a tremendous amount of material in this chapter, and I can only give you an outline of it and comment briefly on some of it. Notice, first of all, if you will, that in Nebuchadnezzar's statement, he starts out with a very powerful statement concerning the glory of the Lord, and then he reiterates it at the end. And I'm simply going to walk you through quickly and show you some of the glorious attributes of God that Nebuchadnezzar has learned. And we'll ask ourselves the question, is this how I see God? First of all, in verse 34, he says, His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. Incidentally, that's almost an exact quote of Psalm 145, verse 13, which suggests that perhaps he had some good mentoring and discipling by Daniel himself, who had introduced him, presumably, to the Psalms of David. What an interesting thought. The most powerful man in the world, ruling the superpower, is sitting down with an exile and being taught the Psalms of David. Notice his enthusiasm uh, for what he discovered of God uh, is, now has to be proclaimed. His dominion is an eternal dominion. In other words, the extent of his power is illimitable and his power is irresistible. He goes on to say that his wisdom is irrefutable, his righteousness is irreproachable, and his justice is impeccable. Every one of those will preach. Every one of those who keep me going for half an hour, you'll be highly relieved to know that I will exercise quite remarkable discipline and move on very quickly. But I hope that you will take the time sometime to ask yourself these questions. Do I honestly believe that the God who is the Most High God has a dominion that is illimitable? There is no limit to the extent of His rule. There is no place on the face of God's green earth. There is not a square inch in the vastness of the universe where God is not God. It's all His. Do I believe that? That has profound ramifications on my life. As far as I personally am concerned, I have the privilege of traveling all over the world, going into every conceivable kind of situation, and I do it with a considerable degree of equanimity for one very simple reason. I am totally convinced his dominion is illimitable and I cannot get away from his presence. His power is irresistible. Now, there's a very real sense in which he limits his power and he limits his power in order that he allows us actually even to resist him. That does not mean that his power is not irresistible. It is that he irresistibly chooses to allow himself to be resisted by people such as we are. He is able to govern his immense strength. I was trying to think of a picture of this, and I was reminded of something I read in the paper maybe a year ago about a family at a zoo. And the father is looking after the little boy uh, or the little child, I'm not sure if it was a boy or a girl, uh, but he's also uh, doing some video camera work, and he doesn't notice that the little boy climbs on the edge of the pit in which the gorillas are, loses his balance, and the little boy falls down into the pit where these huge gorillas are to be found. It's a very scary situation, and one incredibly brave and foolish man jumped down into the pit to do something about it, but they needn't have been concerned. For this huge gorilla comes over to where the child is lying unconscious in the bottom of the pit. Try to imagine the sheer power in this 500-pound gorilla. But instead of going over to the child and simply picking it up and dashing it against the wall, the large gorilla begins to make crying sounds and begins with its huge hand to stroke the head of the little boy. And I have there a picture of almighty power being held under control by sheer grace and compassion and concern. What's your picture of God? Is his dominion illimitable? Is his power irresistible? Would you say that his wisdom is irrefutable? The Apostle Paul would say that. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthians, said this, 
He said, a lot of you people despise the preaching of the cross. He said, I want to tell you something. You can call it foolishness, but what you call foolishness, the foolishness of God, is wiser than the wisdom of man. Do you believe that? There are some incredibly brilliant people in the world who are busy accumulating doctorates. And some of these people who are busy accumulating document, doc, doctorates are lamentably ignorant of the fundamentals. And the fundamentals are this, that God created us, that we rebelled against us, that there's no way we can be reconciled to God, but God took the initiative in humility to come in the person of his Son and go down to the depths of death and hell itself on a cross in order that he might redeem the human race. And many of the brilliant people in the world say that is absolute nonsense and the Apostle Paul says no it is not nonsense it is the fundamental truth it is the only way that any human being who is made by God lives through God is accountable to God can be reconciled to God it's the only way it can happen and many people say that is absolute foolishness and God says it is not foolishness in actual fact it's wiser than the wisdom of man we have to ask ourselves a question. Who do I believe is really smart? God, who insists on doing things just about the opposite way around to the way we would do them, or man, who so often thinks he's smarter than God? Do I believe his dominion is illimitable, his power is irresistible, his wisdom is irrefutable, his righteousness is irreproachable, his justice is impeccable? Nebuchadnezzar didn't always believe that, but he came to believe it. Nebuchadnezzar, we say, excuse me, uh, are you telling us that you believe that God's righteousness is impeccable and his justice, is, his justice is irreproachable? He said, yes, I am. But, but didn't he just cut you down? Didn't he just depose you? Uh, didn't he just teach you the most awful lesson, the hardest possible way? Yes, he did. Well, how in the world can you insist then that his righteousness is irreproachable and his justice is impeccable. How could God do a thing like that? And he said, oh, there's no, no difficulty answering that question. You see, the most important thing a human being can ever learn is God is God and I am not. But I wouldn't listen. But he was so just and he was so right and he was so gracious that he actually dealt with me on a personal basis and he finally got my attention. He was absolutely right to do it. It was perfectly just the way he did it because what happened was absolutely just and absolutely right. The Most High is glorious. Secondly, the Most High is gracious. He is gracious to warn Nebuchadnezzar of impending judgment. I want you to notice that when God gives Nebuchadnezzar this dream, he does not give Nebuchadnezzar this dream because Nebuchadnezzar was engaging in a deep, profound spiritual search. It did not start with Nebuchadnezzar. It was initiated by God. How do I know that? Because this is, this is precisely uh, what, what he says in verse, uh, in verse 4 of, of chapter 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. And I had a dream that made me afraid. Now let me ask you a question. Usually, normally speaking, does the man who has a magnificent palace, who is living in it, contented and prosperous, usually worry about God? There's a very generic question for you. Does the man who has a magnificent palace, who is utterly contented and totally prosperous, usually bother about God? Well, if you don't know the answer, I'll tell you. No, he doesn't usually bother about God. And it is not because he is saying, well, here I am, I've got this magnificent palace and I'm all contented and I'm all prosperous, but oh, do I need God? That is not, not what happened. It is while he is in that situation of being fundamentally disinterested that God takes the initiative and bursts through. And sisters and brothers, you need to know this. Over and over and over again, we, say the same, we see the same thing happen. It is God's incredible grace taking the initiative 
and warning us when we're not even interested in him. The second thing I want you to notice is that this warning that God graciously gives to Nebuchadnezzar is presented in a way that is unmistakable. It's a very alarming vision. It is married to an unmistakably strong proclamation. The Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of men. But then I want you to notice something. After this alarming vision and the strong proclamation from the angelic visitor, Daniel now comes and makes application of it. And his application is remarkably sensitive. Your Majesty, I'm deeply troubled by this vision that you've had. I'm deeply concerned about it, and I'll tell you why. It is, very, it is not good news for you. In fact, I wish that this was for your enemies, not for you. Notice how God communicates with people. He grabs their attention by a dramatic set of events. He gives them an unmistakable proclamation. He gives them a sensitive application, and then he gives them clear instruction as to what they should do about it. Nebuchadnezzar, I'll tell you what you need to do about it. You need to renounce your sins and your wickedness by doing what is right and getting around to living your life in a totally different fashion in obedience to God. That's what you need to do. Isn't God gracious? He takes the initiative. He grabs our attention. He gives us an unmistakable proclamation. He deals with us sensitively, and he gives us unmistakably clear instructions. And he doesn't have to take the initiative, and he doesn't have to be sensitive, and he doesn't have to be dramatic, and he doesn't have to be clear, and he doesn't have to tell us exactly what to do, and he is so incredibly gracious, he does all that. The third thing I want you to notice is this that the warning that was given to Nebuchadnezzar went totally unheeded. Verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar admits it. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, that is twelve months after the vision, as the king was walking on the roof of the palace of Babylon, he said, Is this not the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? What's happening to Nebuchadnezzar? He's been given the warning, and for 12 months, he has carefully, assiduously ignored it. How like a human being who is reluctant to learn this message, God is God and I am not. And after he's heard about the tree being cut down, he's heard about all that he's got to do, he puts it all on one side and he's still strutting around in the magnificent hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the world that he's built. And he's gazing over the city of Babylon, this great city that has been excavated and we know something of its grandeur. And as he's walking around there, what is he saying to himself? Isn't this the great Babylon that I have built? Isn't it my mighty power? And isn't it for the glory of my majesty? Alone, I did it for my own purposes. I, me, my, and mine. And God leans out of heaven. And he says, no, in actual fact, it isn't for your majesty. In actual fact, you didn't build it unaided. In actual fact, I am God and you're not. And your time is up. Jesus said a very similar thing uh, when he told the parable of the rich farmer. The rich farmer had had an abundant crop decided the only thing he could handle it was to pull down his barns and build greater ones. And then he said to himself, this is what I will do. I will pull down my barns, I'll build greater, and I will say to my soul, soul, take your ease, eat, drink, etc., etc." And God leans out of heaven and says, you utter fool. This night, your soul will be required of you. Why? Because God is God and you are not. But what a hard lesson to learn. The amazing thing is this. God graciously warns. God graciously warns us in dramatic, unmistakable ways. God graciously goes on warning, and his patience 
I was going to say is unending, but it isn't unending, for there comes a time when God has done all the warning he's going to do. And in the end, God graciously, having warned, brings what he has promised to happen. Notice why he's doing it. What he is bringing into this man's life, painful in the extreme, is designed for this man's good. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our conscience. But he shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. You see, the simple fact of the matter is this. In all our pleasures that God has made available to us, God is whispering, but we're so busy having fun we don't hear. And in our conscience that he has built into us, God speaks to us, but we can chloroform our conscience when he says something we don't want to hear. So sometimes he stops whispering, and sometimes he stops speaking, and sometimes he gets a, a megaphone, and he shouts and gets our attention, and his megaphone is pain. Smart people respond to whispers. Smart people hear him speak. Unfortunately, we're not very smart. And the tragedy is this. When the pain comes that is his megaphone to get our attention, then instead of listening then, we turn on him and say, how dare you do that to me? And he says, well, I dare, because you see, I'm God. And you're not. There's so much more I could say there, but quickly the third thing, the Most High is generous. Notice how he concludes his statement. He says, when I raised my eyes towards heaven, my sanity was restored. Let me submit to you. When we are brought low by our circumstances and get the picture of who God is, and we turn to him in repentance and faith, at that time, he generously restores our sanity. You said, I wasn't crazy. Well, put it this way. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12 that God renews our mind. Let me give you a little snippet of information to take away with you. If in my mind God is not God, but I'm running the show, then I've not only got God all wrong, I've got me all wrong. Because, you see, if God is my creator and sustainer, I can then begin to understand that I was created in his image, and the greatest insight I can have about my humanity is that I'm created in the image of God. If I believe that Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and he'll be Lord of my life and Lord of my dying, then I can begin to look at myself and say this, it doesn't matter whether I live or whether I die, I belong to the Lord and I have eternal significance. But if I've got God wrong, I've got me wrong. And if I've got me wrong, I've got relationships wrong. And if I've got relationships wrong, I've got society wrong. And what I need is my sanity restoring, the renewing of my mind. Nebuchadnezzar goes on to say that not only when he lifted his eyes to heaven was his sanity generously restored, but when his sanity was restored, he was returned to his true honor and splendor. I'm made in the image of God. I'm redeemable. I'm of eternal significance. But I won't believe any of those things if I haven't acknowledged that God is God, and I am not. He goes even further. He says, when we humble ourselves, he generously raises up higher than before. Peter puts it like this. He said, if you will humble yourself, God will raise you up. But if you raise yourself up, God will humble you. Or as Donald Gray Barnhouse preached in a memorable sermon in England when I was a teenager, the way to up is down. And the way to down is up. Exalt yourself, and God will humble you. Humble yourself, and God will exalt you. And he says, as a result of all this, Nebuchadnezzar says, as a result of all this, 
He said, my pride was dealt with, and now I praise and worship the Lord. He generously accepts our worship. Have you ever thought of it that way? He generously accepts our worship. When I was a boy, hundreds of years ago, the most famous footballer in the world was called Stanley Matthews. And I met him one day. I was just a little pipsqueak, about 12 or 13 years of age. And I got to talk to Stanley Matthews. And I got his autograph. And actually, a reporter from the main national paper got a picture of Stanley Matthews and me. And next day, in the paper, people looked at that picture and said, who's that with Stu Bristow? Nah, uh, just kidding. And I talked to Stanley Matthews, and I told him in a little squeaky pip squeak voice, I think you're the greatest soccer player that I ever saw. I think you're the greatest in the world. Do you think he needed that? Do you think he needed me to tell him that? No, he knew that. The whole world was telling him that. But you know, he was so incredibly generous. He smiled and said, And what gets me is this, that God generously lets me worship. What puzzles me is why I so often am so reluctant to do it. You see, God, most high, is gracious and he's glorious and he's generous. Let me ask you a question. Is this your God? Let's pray together. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, forgive us that so often we have such a wrong perception of you. We prefer our speculations on your character rather than taking the time to study your revelation of yourself in Scripture. And I pray that everybody here this morning might go away from the youngest to the oldest, asking themselves these questions. How well do I know the Most High God? Do I know what it is to humble myself before Him as a sinner, deserving nothing but condemnation, but eligible for grace? And do I live with the attitude of gratitude? Or do I walk around my hanging gardens, surveying my mansion, content and prosperous, and say, just look what I have done. The Lord delivers. And may we become your humble, joyful servants. In Christ's name.